Elizabeth, and welcome to Careers of the Future, a show where students can hear directly from Ms. Smiley's at the leading edge of their fields about how to most effectively prepare for the future of work. My name is Arman Samani, and I'm the lead of the youth team on the Smiley's global site. I'm also a university student, and I'll be your host for this first episode. Throughout this series, we'll have episodes on topics ranging from artificial intelligence to banking to architecture and design. But in this first episode, we wanted to lay the groundwork and try to understand what the future of work even means, why it matters, and what we as students can do to prepare for it. We're delighted to have Zabine Hirji joining us today to talk through these questions. Zabine is a strategic advisor to businesses, governments, and universities. Her current roles include serving as an executive advisor for future of work at Deloitte and as an executive in residence at Simon Fraser University's Business School. Prior to this, she had a distinguished career at the Royal Bank of Canada, which is Canada's largest bank, where she served as Chief Human Resources Officer until 2017. And I just want to share a quick inspiring story with you. When Zabine first immigrated to Canada with her family and started university, she also took on the role of teller at the Royal Bank. Fast forward 30 years from then, and Zabine was appointed as a Chief Human Resources Officer of that very bank, as well as a member of the group's executive, which is a body that sets the strategic direction for the entire organization. If you ask me, I think that that's just a perfect example, that if you put your mind to something, you can truly accomplish anything. Zabine, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Armand. I'm delighted to be here and to have this opportunity to have this conversation with you and to connect with Ismaili students uh, all across the globe. It uh, truly is a privilege. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Zabine. Let's start by setting the table, so to speak. We've all heard the words future of work a lot in recent months, but what does future of work even mean? And what are the trends that are driving the future of work? especially as we emerge out of the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, that's a great place to start. Uh, future of work is probably something we see in every media release, newspaper, uh, webinar. It, it really is a, is a hot topic these days. And I think that's because the pandemic has really uh, been a time machine to the future of work. So the way I think about the macro trends, three trends, technology, demographics, and changing social expectations. So technology is what comes to mind to everyone when we talk about the future of work with AI automation really uh, being very pervasive now. Every business, every industry is, is bringing that into their organizations. And really the way I think about that is the fusion of human and machine, how humans and machine collaborate and work together. And clearly that has many implications for work, which uh, we'll get into as we continue our conversation. The second uh, trend is demographics, and that's perhaps not talked about as much. And here I'll touch on three things. Uh, the first one is really the rise of the millennials and uh, the entry of Gen Z, born in 1997 onwards, into the workforce. And what we'll see there is with this next generation of leadership, I think we'll also see an acceleration of changing business models, different leadership styles, and different work cultures. The second element is diversity, uh, diversity of the countries in which we live, as well as diversity in the workforce. So what does that mean? How does that connect to future of work? Two things there. Firstly, organizations are going to be even more focused on harnessing the diverse ideas, the diverse experiences, that people bring to the table. And for many of us, we bring cultural understanding. Um, we, we may have grown up in different countries. Our parents may have been born in different countries. And so bringing that, that nuances around culture is increasingly important because it drives consumer behavior, for example, and organizations can use that as they use you know, concepts like design thinking, for example, to, to build experiences. The other uh, side of that coin is also how good are we? What, what's our capability really in being more inclusive? How can we bring in different voices to the table, different views to the table to better solve problems? So building that 
capacity to be more inclusive becomes increasingly important. And the last demographic trend is what's uh, often called the 100 year life. Life expectancy of uh, humans is uh, continues to increase. And what that means is people will live longer, they'll work longer. And so this uh, traditional frame of go to school to learn, go to work, and then retire into the sunset or to play golf doesn't really uh, work anymore. People will be working longer, they will be coming in and out of the workforce, and for students that means working with multi-generations and, and getting good at that, getting good at being able to learn from the more mature workers as well as to be able to teach them, and also appreciating that the normal um, trajectories that we had before of retirement patterns is going to change. And the third is um, increasing societal expectations. S society expects business to do more, for businesses to do good, and this notion of stakeholder capitalism, where impact on customer, employee, community is being considered as much as uh, impact to shareholders. So what does this mean to the future of work? A couple of things. It means in terms of leadership, we're really looking for this model of responsible leaders. And that has some new skills that are required. In addition, as organizations put social purpose at the core of their business strategies, they will be looking for employees whose personal purpose, mission, values aligns with that of the organization. And as I think about our community, we have so many people who are involved in, uh, in volunteer service. And those are the kinds of skills that can actually be translated into the workforce. So what does that mean to students today? Firstly, is to really keep on top of how that model is, is changing, but also how you build that flexibility to be able to go in and out of those different models in a way that meets your needs as well as the organization's needs. Because today, we certainly want to be in, in situations where we can meet all of our needs, our work needs, our life needs, our family needs. So the, those different models and being able to be productive and, and happy, in fact, in those different models becomes important. Okay, so three trends to watch is technology, changing demographics, and changing societal expectations. Zabine, maybe let's go a little bit deeper into something that you mentioned, which is that the skills necessary to succeed are going to be changing a little bit. Given these accelerating trends, I'm sure a lot of students are wondering what they should be learning right now. What would you suggest are the most important skills for students to be learning in order to prepare for the future of work? The first one, which I think, again, pops into everyone's minds, is digital skills. And I break that down into, into two aspects. One is just using technology to help you be more productive, to help you collaborate better, and ultimately to, uh, to enable you to contribute at your best. Now, for uh, students today, Gen Z, your digital natives, a lot of that will come quite naturally. That said, my view is get build an expertise really around being able to, essentially, it's the human machine collaboration with yourself to help you be at your best. The second element is really around the organization. So what do you what does digitally savvy or digital fluency mean? That's really about building an understanding about how technology, how data, how digital can be used within your, your uh, specialization or your, your career stream to um, help your organization or to help organizations to better serve customers, to be more efficient, to solve complex problems. So it's really being able to ask the questions, to be able to have some sort of understanding that allows you to use technology, to deploy technology within the, the, your, your chosen careers and to contribute to the organization. The other set of skills is what I call human skills. And some of you may have heard me say the future of work is human. These are cognitive skills and they're social skills. They're transferable, they're enduring. 
So what are these skills? Adaptability, the, the ability really to pivot as the environment changes, as circumstances change, how are you able to essentially just go with the flow? COVID's a great example of that, where we've organizations have had to pivot, but even as individuals, we've had to change so much in our lives. And the good news is that most of us have been able to do that. Other skills include things like uh, communication. And communication is increasingly important. It's not just about being able to get your thoughts across, to be able to get your ideas across, but it's also about being able to influence people, to actually pay attention to them, to, to buy into your ideas and to take actions that, uh, that you think need to be taken for progress. Creativity. Uh, this is an ideas economy. So how do you build that muscle? And, and, and the, the, maybe the final skill I'll touch on is empathy. Again, we've seen that in, in the pandemic, that we have let, uh, in many ways, some of those human traits and qualities really come to the fore. People have needed the compassion, the support, the empathy, the ability to put ourselves in their shoes. And the beauty of that is you actually, by, by being empathetic, by listening to learn, you actually help people to perform better, to be their best. Uh, and sometimes it seems a bit counterproductive, um, but uh, that human quality really does ultimately drive uh, better outcomes. This combination that you're talking about of soft skills and hard skills is really interesting, really helpful, but also a little bit intimidating, I think, for some of us uh, as we start to think, how can we actually learn these skills? Um, so just building on what you were saying, what would you say is the best way for students to go about actually acquiring these skills? And once they have it, showing to employers and others uh, that they actually possess these skills. Uh when you are in those work, uh, work uh, terms, whether it's a co-op or whether it's an internship, I go back to be deliberate about this, the, these uh, human skills that you want to develop. Don't just focus on the technical side of the work. Pull out your list, sit down with your manager, sit down with your colleagues and say, the, the skills that I would really like to focus on are empathy, communication, and critical thinking. Can we talk about what opportunities you think there might be? Let's agree that I'm going to focus on this one or two skills and that you will give me feedback, that you will give me experiential opportunities and the work that I'm doing that will help me with that. And uh, that deliberateness, I think, is, is really important around these skills. And if you can, at the end of your, your work term, ask for the feedback and ask for short written feedback as well. And you can start to incorporate that into your narrative, which is the second part of your question, which is how do you show employers that you have these skills? So as I think about resumes today, they are very, um, they're sequential and they're quite independent. These are the jobs, the list of jobs that I did the list of volunteer activities that I undertook. What's missing, and then we usually have a list of skills. What about creating a narrative that brings in your different experience, job experiences, school experience, volunteer experience, and that really amplifies your human skills? So say, for example, you did a project in the summer in at the AKDN in Tajikistan. And what that called upon was for you to be empathetic, to learn about a new culture, a different culture, to be adaptable, and, and also adapt your communication style to really fit in with some of the cultural norms. The following summer, you worked at a bank. You also may have developed those same skills, collaboration, teamwork, adapting to a very fast-paced environment, for example. So what's the, create an arc really of that storyline that shows how those skills were developed 
throughout your you know, previous four to five years that really amplifies um, your, your human skills. Because many employers will not put that together and it's still pretty hard to, uh, to assess those skills. Thank you, Zavine. That's really helpful. Now I want to pivot a little bit, no pun intended, to talk about the implications of future of work on traditional fields. There's a lot of Ismaili students who probably want to go into fields like banking, medicine, law, and consulting. What does the future of work mean for those traditional fields, and can we still enter them, or do we all have to go and learn how to code now? Uh, well, the good news is you don't all have to learn how to code, and those professions will still be there. What will change is the nature of the work, and we'll see much more of this human-machine collaboration where an augmentation to really help the individuals that are doing this work today, some of the tasks will be, will be removed, and what that's going to mean is that the human skills within those professions will become more important. So let's take a quick example here and uh, think of radiologists. There has been uh, AI that's developed to read MRIs, to read images and interpret them at a more, with more accuracy than radiologists. So does that mean we don't need radiologists anymore? Of course not. What that means though, it'll now give the radiologist an opportunity to actually engage with the patient, to be part of, um, of the team that's working with the patient and helping to diagnose the issue, helping to come up with the treatment plan in conjunction with the other physicians that are involved. And they will have this also the opportunity to better explain to the patient what the imaging says, what it means, and to, to help perhaps allay some of the fears that naturally uh, emerge when, when patients are going through this kind of a situation. Okay, that's really helpful and I think really good news uh, for many students watching this right now. Um, Zabine, you're an active leader in civil society, along with many of your other different boards and volunteer positions that you have. You currently chair Civic Action, which is a city building organization. Looking back, what advice would you give your 20-year-old self about community service and how you can use that to prepare yourself for your future career? I'm fortunate to have the opportunity to spend a lot of my time in, uh, in service and in community work. And this is something that I started, uh, I would say, in my late 30s, in terms of really making it a, a, a big part of my life and the advice I would give my 20-year-old self was that I should have started it sooner. And why do I say that? For many reasons. First of all, what you learn from, from engaging in, 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 with community organizations and from people that come from all different sectors, all, um, all socioeconomic levels, is, is really quite significant and it teaches you a lot of the, the human skills I talked about, like empathy. Um, and I think it would have made me a better manager, a better leader, a better, a better mom. I wasn't a mom in my 20s, by the way, but uh, as, I, as I got into my 30s. And uh, it would also have given me different, you know, a lot of connections, people in business that can open up career opportunities. And the most important thing I think that work does though, is it fills you up. It, it, it's really what I say to some people, it's soul food, you know? It really gives you a, a, a level of satisfaction and happiness that is so important to our personal well-being and, uh, and so needed in, in our uh, even busier lives today. Students uh, today have even more pressures uh, and I think engaging in community and civil society within our own community uh, really is, is something that complements what we do and making that time uh, will pay off. And as I say, I, I get much more than I give. Well, that's very inspiring, uh, Zabine. Now, you sit at almost the front row to see what's happening with the future of work, what the trends are, what the opportunities are. 
For students watching this, what are three almost rapid fire bullet point pieces of advice uh, that you would give us? So number one is uh, lifelong learning. And I know you're still early in your life, but this is the time to really build that muscle so that you can flex it when you need it. And build a love of learning. It's, it's not something that uh, should be seen as a burden, but in fact, something that's, that's seen um, as enjoyable. I mean, that is something that I would say has been a hallmark of my life where I actually enjoy learning. I'm curious. I like to ask people questions. I like to meet different people. So really uh, build that capability, embed it in your DNA. The, the, the second thing that I would say is, and, and this is not something that was talked about when I was a student, which is self-care. Life is full of challenges and life is full of opportunities. But in order to really be at your best, to, to be prepared, to be able to seize those opportunities, we have to take care of ourselves, not just our physical health, but our mental health. Students have a lot of pressures today, performance pressure, financial pressures. Many students have one, two, even three part-time jobs as they're going to school. They're living in different cities, away from their support structures, their families, their friends, and the pandemic is making it even more challenging. So take the time, be kind to yourself, get enough sleep, uh, talk to people if you've got issues, tap into your friends, your family, and ask for help. Asking for help is a strength. Being vulnerable is a strength. It actually builds relationships and it builds that resilience. Yes, uh, and I would say pursue your passion. Look for the careers where you can really be at that intersect of passion, of harnessing your strengths and a future opportunity. And that's not easy. I, I, I get that. But when we are aligned with our purpose, with what matters to us, with what gives us meaning in life, we are actually at our best. And once you've made that choice, strive for excellence. Do everything you can to optimize your learning, to, to really take advantage of, of uh, being in school or once you're, once you're in your, your job market. But I found certainly in, for me, that happened uh, halfway through my career where I found that intersect of, of passion, strength, um, and opportunity. And that's when I moved into human resources from the business side of the bank where I had spent the first uh, 20 years of my career. And I found that meaning. The, for me, the opportunity to make a difference to the lives of 80,000 employees in the organization was deeply meaningful. And I, I made the rest of my career in, in that space. And of course, today, continue to do work as uh, in, in the future of workspace and even more broadly focused around building uh, inclusive prosperity through unlocking the potential of people. So don't be afraid to follow your passion and bring in the other elements of strength and uh, future opportunities. Thank you. This has been a really exciting and also really helpful conversation. Perhaps as a last question, if I'm a student who's watched this, I was really inspired and I want to take action to start preparing myself for the future of work, what's the first thing I can do as soon as I turn off my laptop uh, to start preparing myself to be on the offensive rather than the defensive uh, when it comes to preparing myself for a future career? That's great framing is to be in, in the, on the offensive and proactive. Well, you've already started. You, you're watching this, so clearly you're open to new ideas and you're pursuing your education. So those are really important pieces. What I would say is get more deliberate about some of your learning. We've talked a lot about human skills and one of the things you might consider is really build this as a portfolio, just as you have investment portfolios, build your skills and experience portfolio. 
and think about it in that way. You don't just make an investment and then stop in your investment portfolio. You manage it. You add to it. You add new future focus skills to it. You, um, you shed skills that are no longer helpful to you and really creating that that balanced portfolio very deliberately making those choices and looking to uh, to build those skills and just make it part of your routine and do one thing every day to push yourself outside your comfort zone it doesn't have to be a big thing for me during covid it was planting tomato plants uh something that sounds, uh, you know, uh, a, a little bit out of place here, but for me, that was pushing myself to do something I hadn't done before. And uh, it's become a great piece of conversation with my neighbors. And uh, I'm learning a lot from, uh, from my neighbors and building great relationships. So uh, maybe an odd note to end on, but learning can be fun. And, and that's something that to the students and the young people is, is an important message. Yes, work hard, but take the time to smell the roses or the tomatoes and have some fun along the way. This is a lifelong journey and enjoy it. Zabine, thank you so much uh, for sharing your insights, your experiences and perspectives with us today. I think this was a really fun conversation um, and something that I know I personally learned a lot from. And for those watching this at home, uh, please know that Zabine regularly posts about these topics on platforms such as LinkedIn, so I do encourage you to check it out. And thank you for joining us today. Do stay tuned to The Ismaili for future episodes of Careers of the Future, where we'll be interviewing Ismailis at the leading edge of their fields to find out how those fields are changing and what we as students can do to prepare for the future of work. Thank you so much for joining us.